Our next speaker is Father Christopher Zuger. I had the honor of discovering the Byzantine Church um, at his hands and by his explanation in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I was born. Father Christopher Lawrence Zuger is born in Buffalo, New York in 1954. He is a graduate of St. Bonaventure University in 1977 and the Washington Theological Union in 1981. He was ordained a priest in 1981 for the Byzantine Catholic Eparchy of Passaic. As a seminary and priest, he was active in the Passaic Office of Religious Education, serving youth and young adult ministries, and as St. Gregory of Nyssa Church in Beltsville, Maryland. Due to health reasons, he began service at the newly founded Eparchy of Van Nuys, serving at St. Stephen Church in Phoenix, Arizona, and founding St. Thomas Church in Gilbert in 1982. In 1985, he was named a pastor of Our Lady of Perpetual Help in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he also served the Las Cruces mission. In 2008, he had to take a medical requirement retirement, but was asked by the eparchy to remain in Albuquerque, where he served as a confessor, religious studies teacher, spiritual director, and chaplain of high school and university student groups. His publications include The Forgotten, Catholics in the Soviet Empire from Lenin to Stalin, Finding the Hidden Church, Looking to Tomorrow, History and Mission of the Byzantine Catholic Church, and forthcoming volume, Keeping the Faith, Catholics in the Soviet Gulag and Exile. On a personal note, uh, I discovered Father Grace in his parish when I was 16 or 17, I believe. Yeah. When I turned 18, um, he took me on as somewhat care for him, caring for him in his illness. And I, I oftentimes think one of the greatest virtues you have, Father Chris, is to suffer well. And that is, that is so necessary, especially for a young man discerning priesthood, um, to see a man who is serving as a priest so well, even in his weakness. I, I, I traveled the world with him when I turned 18 to New York City a couple times, to Ukraine a couple times. Transcarpathia, when he's writing these books, I think my photo's in one of them, forgotten, I believe, in yeah. the Mania books. Um, I do want to say that, that whenever I'm suffering in a much less dramatic way, I remember the many times when I would be helping Father Chris get ready for bed or up in the morning or getting him around the world, um, when I could tell he was suffering immensely. And he'd be whispering names while he was suffering. People he was suffering for. You know, the, the, the poor and the suffering in China. I think I heard my name a couple times. <laughs> Your name was there often. <laughs> So it, it was an immense honor for the Chris. Thank you for introducing me to the Byzantine and the Church, to the priesthood, and uh, thank you for your ministry to all of us. Thank, thank you very Christ. much. Goodness gracious, after that intro, what am I going to do? Um, oh, I do know what I have to do. Books. So my, uh, Finding a Hidden Church, you can get that over at uh, Jack Fiegel's table, Eastern Christian Publications. That's about the church in the underground. And Michael is the one who got me started going over there um, to interview people uh, from the underground years in um, S Slovakia and Hungary and in Ukraine in Z Zakarpati Oblast. And also my brand new book, got published thanks to Father Deskevich and Byzantine Seminary Press that's looking to tomorrow, which is just a little thing, 800 pages of the history of our church from Cyril and Methodius to today. Took me a couple weeks to write that, you know, <laughs> 1,200 years and stuff. Actually, last weekend I was in San Diego. There was a conference for our parishes in Southern California, and they wanted me to come out and do a summary of the 1,200 years of history and to do that in two hours. And I said, it took me 10 years to get that book written. How am I going to do it in two hours? So today, thank God, Father Simbala did not ask me to do that in less than one hour. Uh, but rather, this is the United States. So what I'm speaking on today is the history of our church in the United States. And uh, with an emphasis, though, on evangelization. In your folders is this. So on one side is where our church came from the people who emigrated here starting in the early 1880s coming to the United States. Uh, it is uh, the particular Ruthenian Catholic Church, a Byzantine Catholic Church that we have now in the metropolitan province of Pittsburgh, came out of the Kingdom of Hungary in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And if you look at the map, the Transcarpathian region, Slovakia and northern Hungary, 
that whole corner from the northern border of Transylvania up and beyond the Tisa River mark that's on there. If you just go a straight line from that corner, that's the main heartland of the original territory of the Byzantine Catholic Church and was in the territory of the Eparchy of Mukachevo. Now, way over in the lower part of the yellow is Croatia, Slavonia. That is where the town of Križesi is, which was the second eparchy, all right, and uh, founded in 1611 when a large group of Croatians and Serbs united with the Holy See and were recognized by Rome in 1777. The eparchy of Preshov was the main eparchy for Slovakia, and then the eparchy of Hajdudorog was the main eparchy for um, the Hungarian plain. Now, as you'll see on the page, I put the original ethnic groups in the Kingdom of Hungary for our church were Croat, German, Hungarian, Jewish, Romanian, Rusin or Carpatho-Russian, Serb, and Slovak. Those were the main populations. Lots of Rusins and Slovaks moved down into Croatia, Slavonia, were brought there as colonists by the government in the 16 and 1700s. And that's why we have such a big distance between those two territories. So there is a thriving church in modern Croatia and Serbia uh, as a result of that. Now, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church is literally next door in this case. I had no idea there was a Ukrainian parish right next to, to this parish until we got here. Uh, but it was in Galicia, which was under Austrian rule. So the Kingdom of Hungary was the territory uh, where our church was concentrated, all right? Galicia, which is the, the, the real stronghold of Ukrainian nationalism uh, under the Austrians, you know, was under direct rule from Vienna. So just so you know. Okay, so something to remember is this. Our church in Europe is founded by St. Cyril and Methodius, which is why the seminary is dedicated to Cyril and Methodius. The disciples of Cyril and Methodius came out of Great Moravia in the ninth century to proclaim the gospel in the language of the people among ordinary people. The Latin church, when it sent its missionaries across Western and Northern Europe, evangelized the nobility, the royalty, these Greek missionaries did not do that. They evangelized among the peasants, the Vlach herdsmen, artisans, miners, uh, woodworkers, people who were very ordinary folk. And the church took deep, deep root as a result in these different cultures. The nationalities that I list on your handout are the people who identify themselves as such in the last imperial census as being members of these eparchies, of Mukachevo, Križesi, Preshov, Hajdudorok, that this is, it was a, a diverse church, a rich church, a multilingual church, worshiping in Slavonic and in Hungarian, yes, but very multi-ethnic and very diverse in terms of economics, in terms of location. So there was not just villagers, as, uh, Professor Magashi was saying earlier, you know, living up in the mountains. They're all over the place. They're all over the place in towns and villages and, and big cities. Now, the emigration came out of the Kingdom of Hungary starting in the 1880s. Why? There were a lot of reasons. First, poverty. There was a rapid population growth because of the improvement of health care. Because of the rapid population growth, there was a decline in the amount of land available for younger sons to inherit or to go out and make new farms and set themselves up. It was real poverty. There were famines, a number of famines in the 1880s in northern Hungary uh, because of climate change something we're all familiar with now. Uh, there were liberal laws in Hungary and Austria allowing people to emigrate. They could not emigrate easily until the 1880s. And there were shipping lines that came out of Trieste. So you could stay within Austria-Hungary in order to make the trip to America, sailing on the Austro-Hungarian Cunard lines um, out of the port of Trieste. There was exploitation by the landlords. When I was writing my history, I came across an article in the Chicago Tribune uh, from the early 1900s detailing how the Ruthenian peasants had devoted the entire year 
to raising their crops, and then the nobility would have a two-week hunting season that was always at harvest time. And the deer and the wild boar were driven into the fields, which of course they would consume or trample down. And this reporter watched a year's work disappear in a day from these farms as the nobility would chase the wild animals in order to shoot them and leave these massive piles of carcasses behind. So it was a lot going on. Once people were coming to America, men would write back to their relatives and friends saying, in Hungary, I work all day for 15 cents. In America, I work for an hour and I get 25 cents. And they had, you know, there was a transatlantic travel, which we don't realize, uh, of people going back and forth, back and forth. And a lot of people went back bought up good farms, opened a store, founded a business with the money they made in America. And one of the big drawing cards of coming to America was public schools. Free public schools for as long as you wanted to go and even if you were 18 years old. It was a tremendous opportunity for these families to see their children get a completely different life. So they were recruited heavily by American mining companies because a lot of them were miners. There were mines already in the Kingdom of Hungary and manufacturing companies in Pennsylvania, Ohio, New Jersey, and so forth, and the railroads for construction. And there were coal mines all the way out to Wyoming. We used to have a parish in Rock Springs called St. Cyril and Methodius. Never had a priest. They saw a priest maybe once a year, but these people were all over America, as you can see underneath the map, that they were concentrated at this, at, after the 1910 census in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Ohio, but also in the Rocky Mountains, Virginia, and New England. So all over you had Greek Catholic parishes. Now, the heartbreak of the emigration is this. We had this marvelous lady when I was at St. Thomas Church in Rahway, New Jersey, which, by the way, it's nice to see some people here that I knew from Rahway, uh, named Helen Faleski. Some of you may have remembered her. She was 90 years old when I was there. She was 90 years old, and she told the story to our high school youth group that she talked to them. She was 16 years old, bought a ticket to sail to New York City all alone. Did not speak English, of course. Her family lived in the mountains, in the Hutzel region. They came down, traveled by cart to the railroad station. She boarded the train, ran through the co coaches in order to get to the end of the train so she could wave goodbye. And she told the kids that her last memory of the Carpathian region was her father in his big Hutzel sheep coat running after the train with his arms out like that and crying. And the last picture she had of him was when he fell down as the train rounded a curve and she couldn't see him anymore. And she said, and at that moment I realized what I had done and that I was never going to see him again. And that we have to give great credit to the people who came here and founded the parishes that we are privileged to worship in and work in and pray in. We are so gifted by the heroism of those men and women who came here facing a totally unknown future in a totally unknown land. And what they did coming here was just remarkable. So the main flow of immigrants was Croatian, Hungarian, Rusins, and Slovaks. And when they came to America, they founded parishes by having lay brotherhoods. The lay brotherhoods were the, the foundation of our modern Greek Catholic Union. And these lay associations would get people together from the same villages or the same county in Europe, recruit people to come and settle in specific areas, arrange marriages, and build churches. And they would write back to Europe to the bishops in those different eparchies, asking them for priests, because here we are abandoned. Right? They came here with no priests, the churches were Roman Catholic, worshiping in Latin. The closest they could get was if there was a Slovak parish or a Polish parish where a priest might understand part of what they are, were saying in their various dialects or a Hungarian parish, depending on the language. 
And they would gather together for Vespers on Saturday night and Sunday morning matins. They all came with big prayer books. Some of you may have seen them over the years uh, and would uh, have their prayers afterwards and socialize. Right? And as we all know, in Byzantine Catholic churches, you have got to party. <laughs> you have to have food on Sunday. All right, my parish always has a, a full Sunday dinner, I swear, every Sunday. Um, and the cantors took on a very prominent role. A lot of the cantors were known as professor as a result. They were the religion teachers. They were the leaders of worship. They were the ones who led uh, funeral services. They were the ones who led baptisms. They were the ones who led everything. All right? So lay initiative was extremely important. The priests saw themselves, those first missionaries, as being dependent upon the European eparchies. Why? Because inevitably, when they would go and present their identification to the local Latin bishop, it usually did not go well, as some of you may know. And eventually, the Vatican had to step in and clarified that first off, all of the missionary priests had to be under Latin bishops under the authority of the Latin bishop. They wanted the churches incorporated in the name of the local diocese. Uh, but the people resisted that. They usually tried to incorporate them in the name of a council of trustees of the curators. The second thing was celibacy was mandated very early. 1890 is the first official letter from the Holy See declaring that all missionary priests who are Greek Catholic or any Eastern Catholic for that matter had to be celibate because celibacy was the norm for the Latin clergy in the United States, which was the majority. The third point was that gradually there were limits imposed on their ritual life, as we'll see. The fourth Lateran Council had mandated two things that there could not be two bishops of different rights within the same city or territory. But if a Latin bishop had faithful from different ritual churches, vicars must be appointed to coordinate parochial ministry among those ritual churches and parishes had to be provided. Unfortunately, although the Latin hierarchy in the United States was very good at quoting the first half of the canon, they did not want a Greek Catholic bishop in the United States, they always ignored the second half of the canon about appointing vicars. And so these priests were way too often on their own. There were very few bishops or archbishops who really took care of the parishes and really served the parishes. Now, in terms of evangelization, I found it really interesting when I got the statistics from the first year that they were collected on a national level for the first Greek Catholic exarchate in 1907. There were 400 converts. They were not from orthodoxy and they were not Latin Catholics transferring in. They were real, honest to goodness, converts from other Christian traditions or no Christian tradition. So these priests who were coming here and serving sometimes three parishes or more, traveling by horse and buggy in difficult conditions, not speaking English, were able to minister to other Americans and have converts come into our church. So the idea that people like me and Father Michael O'Loughlin and a lot of you who come from a wide variety of ethnic backgrounds coming into the faith, either from the Latin church or elsewhere, you know, was a recent phenomenon is not true at all. This goes back a long ways. I mean, literally over a hundred years. So we have are a missionary church, and we have always been a missionary church. A lot of the ethnic Hungarians in the kingdom of Hungary who were Greek Catholic were converts from Calvinism, which I've always wondered how the heck that worked to go from being a reformed Puritan-style Protestant 
to a church with a 40-foot iconostas and all kinds of customs and incense and holy water and uh, you know, all these great things that we get to do throughout the liturgical year. And I mean, Reformed worship, if you've ever been in a Reformed church, is pretty blah. And then you go from that to us. And so when I went to Hungary, I was asking why. And they said, you know what the first thing was? The priests were married. And, and Reformed people were saying, well, you know, this guy, he actually does know what I'm talking about. It was a big drawing card for them. And it shows the importance and significance of, of the married clergy that, that existed in Eastern Europe. Uh, and so these married priests went out and evangelized. And another big drawing card, the pilgrimages. Lots of conversions took place at Mariupoch and other shrines like that. Boronjevo and uh, Krasny Brod and so forth, where lots of people would go in out of curiosity and end up being drawn to our faith. So, always a multi-ethnic church, always a church that was a mission church, and always a church that provides for people outside of the spiritual community. In the book of the prophet Isaiah, what does God say? My house shall be a house of prayer for all people. Right? And that's what we want, and that's who we are. So the challenges to maintaining the Greek Catholic Church in America were several. First, there was hostility and confusion on the part of the Latin majority. The famous, most famous story is Archbishop John Ireland in Minneapolis. Uh, the bishops of the United States, when I was a seminarian, wanted to introduce his cause for sainthood, as there were only a few people who chuckled. And Bishop Michael Dudik, who ordained me, he got up at the meeting and he said, you can't do this. He's the father of the Orthodox Church in the United States. If it wasn't for him, there wouldn't be an Orthodox Church in the United States. None of them knew what he was talking about, so he proceeded to educate them. And when he was done, they said, oh, yeah, you're right. We can't offer open sainthood for this guy. And what happened is Father Alexis Toth, who was a widower, went to Minneapolis to serve in the church, uh, which was in the name of the diocese. That's important. That's how it was incorporated. And when he went in, they spoke in Latin. Archbishop Ireland only spoke English, and uh, Father Toth did not know that much English yet. They spoke in Latin. He presented his papers from his bishop in Prashop and explained who he was, and everything was going pretty good until he mentioned the death of his wife. Because even though the Vatican had mandated celibate clergy, there were still a lot of priests coming, vast majority of priests were married, because in Europe, the vast majority of priests were married. And there were very few celibates. And so Ireland exploded. And he himself later said that he lost his temper and behaved badly. And he yelled at him, I do not want a priest like you. Now, mind you, the guy is widowed. The wife is gone, but his priesthood was impure right? because he had been married. And so Ireland yells at him, carries on terribly. Toth says, I'm a legitimate priest. No, you're not. I don't recognize you. I don't recognize your priesthood. I don't recognize your bishop. And they parted ways, quite literally. And Ireland sent the police to close the church which is why a lot of our churches were not incorporated in the names of local dioceses, because that could happen. You could lose the building. So as a result, Toth's parishioners wrote to the Russian Orthodox Bishop who had just moved from Alaska to San Francisco. And the Russian Orthodox Bishop, of course, was thrilled to receive them, sent icons for the church, they, off they go and they become an Orthodox parish. A small minority remained Catholic, and our parish in uh, Minneapolis and the Ukrainian parish in Minneapolis are descended from that small minority and later immigrants. Why is that important? That's an extreme example of what happened in way too many chancery buildings, where married priests came in and were rejected, or simply they were rejected because they were following the Byzantine rite. And it was very, you know, there was a lack of education, a lack of understanding, a lack of, of knowledge, on one level, but on a deeper level, it was an inexcusable behavior because I found books from the main seminary in the United States at the time that detailed all of the Eastern Catholic churches 
and their worship and so forth. So a little reading would have helped the cause dramatically. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Bishop Ortinsky was sent here in 1907 for the first ordinariate that was created, and there the Vatican stepped in, limited his authority. He had to ask the local Roman Catholic bishop before he could make a visitation of, of his own parish. All right. No matter where he was, he had to write ahead to the local Latin diocese to make a visitation of his own parishes. The, Chrismation was taken away from the parish priests. Infant communion, of course, was long since gone, but chrismation was taken away. That was very upsetting to the people. Only the bishop was allowed to do chrismation, and he had very limited authority. And he wrote back to Rome that, you know, you've humiliated me. And in fact, it became a scandal throughout the Orthodox world and was used in Orthodox propaganda among Greek Catholic immigrants in the United States. The, Churches were lost on a massive scale up to 150,000 to 200,000 people became Orthodox in that time frame between 1890 and 1910. That's a lot of people because the imperial government of Russia funded uh, creation of new parishes, funded the building of new churches and paid the salaries of the priests. Whereas in the Catholic parishes, the people had to fund everything and pay for the salary. Another reason the imperial government did that was because of the transatlantic travel. People going back to settle, people going back to visit. They brought Orthodox literature with them into Austria-Hungary. And this was used during World War I to destabilize the country. It was a great fear on the part of the Austro-Hungarian government that if a war was coming, which they all knew a war was coming, because of the various alliances in Eastern Europe, that the Orthodox in Hungary and Galicia would rise up and support a Russian invasion, which indeed did happen. And the Russians, when they invaded Galicia in 1915, persecuted the Catholics terribly. So those are all major issues, all right, that were weakening the church. Chronic shortage of priests. There were never enough priests. There was always a shortage of priests. And finally, a big change that came was in 1920. In 1920, 14,000 people were allowed to emigrate from Czechoslovakia to the United States. Four years later, the racial exclusionary laws were passed based on the census not of 1920 or 1910 or 1900. You know, but they were slanted in order to favor immigration from Northern Europe. 3,000 people was the limit for Czechoslovakia every year. So we had a parishioner in Rawway who came to America in 1938, left his wife and son behind. He saw them again in 1978. It took that long to get them out of the Soviet Union with World War II and the annexation after the war and so forth. It took him 40 years before he could see his wife and son again. So the son came with children, you know, and they had suffered for being the family of an American. So the end of the immigration is significant for us. Why? Two reasons. One, it forces the Americanization of the church because there's no more large scale immigration ever again. Two, in Canada, this is the beginning of the foundation of the Exarchate of St. Cyril and Methodius up there, because Hungarian and Slovak Greek Catholics were now cut off from emigrating to the United States, but a lot went to Ontario and Alberta and founded parishes there, uh, which became the, the Slovak parishes became the foundation of that Exarchate. So in 1924, the separate Ruthenian and Ukrainian jurisdictions were created. Next year is the 100th anniversary of that. And Bishop Basil Takac was appointed. He came from Czechoslovakia to settle in the United States as the first exarch for the United States for the Ruthenian church. Why? Because the nuncio, the papal nuncio in Washington, told the priests, I have more trouble from you guys than I do from all of the Latin dioceses combined. That's a direct quote, uh, because of the fighting as to who are we in terms of nationality. And so they split. 
Now, theoretically, the division was between those who came from the kingdom of Hungary versus those who came from Galicia, but actually, a lot of the parishes voted depending on their pastor. I like my pastor. I like my cantor. My cantor came from Preshov. Let's vote for a Ruthenian. Okay, so that's what they did. So you have 12 Hungarian language parishes that voted to become Ukrainian. So uh, as a result, and the Sisters of St. Basil had to do the same thing. Yeah, this is where we get our province in Uniontown versus Ukrainian province in Fox Chase. So everything had to be divided, it took quite a while. That's a headache for the bishop, of course. And five years later, we have what I put in quote marks on the back, if you're following me along on the back of that page, number six, the celibacy schism of 1929. I put in quotes because it's not really about celibacy only. Cum data fuerit was a decree from the Holy See whereby they imposed the mandatory celibacy and forbade the ordination of married men permanently. This was the, the precipitating cause because there were two married deacons who were preparing to be ordained that year and permission was refused. The bishop had to always write and ask permission before he could ordain a married man to the priesthood. They stopped it because mandatory celibacy had spread throughout most Eastern Catholic churches, including the Ukrainians, in a number of countries in the world, and they really thought in Rome it would not be an issue, which it was a huge issue because they got continued complaints from the American bishops about these married clergy serving, but the people were emotionally very attached. It was also, though, in the decree to increase the bishop's control and reduce the influence and control of trustees in the parishes for the authority of the bishop to be built up, for the exarchate to be built up, for all the property to be signed over to the bishop and to the authority of the church, there had been a failure to build a seminary, and they also were trying to deal with the expanding demands for use of English in sermons and in worship. And there were tensions among the priests because Bishop Takac, when he came from Czechoslovakia, brought a number of Hungarian-speaking priests who he surrounded himself with and who formed a separate, almost, division within the Exarchate. So there were a number of things that were happening. When the split happened over the span of six years from 1929 to 1937, 1937, the American, Carpatho-Russian, Orthodox, Greek, Catholic, independent diocese of North America in the United States was founded. Longest name of a church I've ever seen in my life. Akrod, I took 100 and 110,000 to 150,000 people left our church as a result. Almost every parish was divided, and the exarchate spent great amounts of money trying to retain properties through court cases because the incorporation papers were not uniform, and it was very difficult sometimes to determine if a parish was Greek Catholic or was a parish meant to be orthodox or was it independent of anybody? And that's where that came from. So it did affect our church, not just because of that, all right, the court cases and the drawn out nature. Families were permanently divided. I knew people here in Jersey who never spoke to some of their relatives or friends again, parents who lost their children over which way the family went. And also because of that division, but then the ethnic issue. So those who had a Russian orientation tended to go with the new church, Carpatho-Russian. But then the Rusins and Slovaks and others were saying, well, what are we? Are we American? Are we Slavish? Are we Slovak? Who are we? What language do we use? And, I, and it gave more impetus you know, for the, the demand for English. And then the church you know, begins its shift away from starting to give up use of the phrase Greek Catholic and really moving to a, a more neutral identity under Bishop Ivancho in particular because he formalizes the use of the phrase the Catholic Church of the Byzantine Rite, no longer Greek Rite in 1950, and then our seminary opened in 1951. Since all of those eparchies in Europe were now ruled by the communists and some had completely disappeared such as Mukachevo and Preshov. Now, number seven is the Latinization drive. Bishop Ivancho was succeeded by Bishop Nicholas Elko. 
Bishop Elko was the first American-born bishop in the United States, and he was bishop from 1954 to 67. He had constant pressure on the clergy to add Latin-style devotions and tear out Eastern furnishings. He deliberately ordered the construction of new churches as the church expanded into the south and into the west and into the suburbs without icon screens. And there's lots of churches that were like this. And as one priest told me, he says, I built that church with the biggest wide open sanctuary I could ever think of, so there would never be an iconostas in it. And then I put an iconostas in it in the 1980s. So, as a matter of fact, but how we went through, and you know, there was widespread destruction of iconostases, of taking out the banners and the icons, putting in statues, um, increasing use of the Holy Rosary, benediction of the Blessed Sacrament at the end of Malevins, um, and it was the final death blow to Vespers, Matins, pre-sanctified in parishes. Those services all disappear, and we had the introduction of what some of you may remember, low mass, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning was low mass in English, and then high mass was choir singing in Slavonic at 10 o'clock. And shortening the liturgy. When I was ordained, you had to get the liturgy done within an hour on Sunday, you know, preferably 50 minutes. You know, and people would come up to me on Super Bowl Sunday and say, it's not going to go long, Father, is it? And I would say, the Super Bowl's at 6. What do you care? <laughs> i got to go home and cook. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> So, and this is a very good example. This lady came to me and she said, you know what? I was born in South Carpathian Rus. I was born near uh, Mukachevo. We came to Pennsylvania. We built a beautiful church with an iconostas up to the ceiling. I got married. We moved to New Jersey. We built a beautiful church with an iconostas up to the ceiling. Priest came in. He took off all the top rows and said, that's Greek Catholic. Next priest came in and he put in statues in front of the iconostas. He said, that's Greek Catholic. Next priest came in, he put in more statues and took out all the banners and he said, that's Greek Catholic. Then we built a new church with no iconostas and all statues. And I said, okay, through everything, Father. But then we get a new priest. He's putting in iconostas. He took out the statues. He put in vespers. He's putting in matins. We have the service during Lent. I don't know what we're doing. I think I'm Presbyterian. But that's what people lived through in one lifetime. That's a lot. That's a lot. Now, the expansion into the South and the West, again, lay initiative is so important. Every parish in the eparchy of the Holy Protection of Phoenix is founded by lay people. Every single parish. But even before that, uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa in Beltsville, Maryland, was founded by young workers recruited from Pennsylvania and Ohio to go to Washington in the newly expanding government during the Cold War. They went to Pittsburgh, met with Bishop Elko, and they said, we want a church in Washington, D.C., and he said, that's too far south. I can't send a priest that far south. And within 10 years, there was a church in Miami, Florida. That's how fast we expanded plus the expansion out of the cities, and the beginning of the end for coal mining, and the starting of the loss of factories, and this big shift that so many of us lived through of going from the industrial powerhouse of the world to what is laughingly called the Rust Belt, and how that affected parishes, and people moving, and having to move into established new communities. The big debate in those years was, are we a different mass, or are we a unique spiritual tradition within Catholicism? That was the big struggle. And Vatican II put us on the map and gave us permission, if you will, to start putting back icon screens. Why? Because the first decree out of Vatican II is Orientalium Ecclesiarum, right, on Eastern churches. And it specifies that the Eastern Catholics have the obligation to proclaim the gospel to all nations and to restore its authentic traditions where they have been lost. 
And it's perfect timing for the building of new churches in the suburbs, in the south, and in the west. And we have a flood of publications coming out from Father Monsignor William Lev Kulik in Duquesne, uh, Malevans, Akathists, Presanctified, the Restoration of Services, Bishop Kachisko and Bishop Dudik had put the brakes on the Latinization drive. And then, of course, in 1969, we have the creation of the Metropolitan Province of Pittsburgh with the, with the three eparchies expanded in 82 with the foundation of the Eparchy of Van Nuys, now the Eparchy of Phoenix, and then, of course, last year with the addition of the Exarchate in Canada. Now, the expansion of the suburbs meant leaving the old neighborhoods, and here is where I think our church made a mistake. Not in, I understand moving out, following the people, but we never thought to evangelize in the old neighborhoods. I, I celebrated liturgy for years in Albuquerque in English, Spanish, and Slavonic in one service. And everybody did fine with it. We needed all three languages because of the population we had. Um, and it worked fine. But we were afraid to do that. And the obligation to proclaim the gospel to all nations is an obligation from Jesus Christ, not just the Vatican. So in this building of a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, solidly Eastern Catholic church, open to all people, one of the big things is the last time I saw this many Byzantine Catholics in a room was at our 25th anniversary for the Eparchy of Phoenix, and the last time before that was the catechetical congresses that were held back here. You know, these great movements of bringing people together like this to talk, pray, and, and visit with one another and be rooted with one another. And how important that is, because we as believing people have an attractive church with traditional worship, small community, solid Eucharistic theology, and a solid, healthy Marian devotion. And that is what people are looking for in this world. 33, every state in the union, except North and South Dakota, now has 33% or more where, no, where people have no religious affiliation. In New Mexico, with a 400-year-old Catholic history, 47% of New Mexicans have no church affiliation at all. We have so much that we can offer. Going back to the beginning, that's why I titled my book, Looking to Tomorrow. Going back to the beginning, a church that proclaims the gospel in the language of the people, no matter their economic class, no matter their ethnicity. Look at those, at those names again on the front. Croat, German, Hungarian, Jewish, Romanian, Rusin, Serb, Slovak. And yet they all got along in one church. The same thing here in America for us. Knowing our faith, knowing our Byzantine practices and origins, using all the stuff that's out in the next room from Seminary Press and God with us and making good use of it. In the last 30 years, we have seen an explosion of interest in Eastern Christianity in the United States. At the same time that through the Holy Spirit, we had an explosion in our church of material, of abandoning a Latinized different mass mentality to this, to being a strong, healthy, living church. I'm going to end with this. Gen Z, the young adults of today, 37% have no church affiliation. 9% are atheists. 9% are agnostic. Only one-fourth are Catholic. 60% do not worship regularly at all. Their parents did not even say grace before meals with them, is the report from them. And I know this from experience being a university chaplain. 58% of Gen Z said they have no religious education at all. 39% say they always feel alone. Religious praxis makes someone happier. It increases your social life, especially in our churches. And when college kids come to my church, you know what, after liturgy, you know what the parents want to do? Feed them. You want college kids to come to your church? Pizza. 
Even better, dinner. <laughs> but they're starving. They're starving. We can emphasize the benefits of religious worship, of coming out, of getting into connections with others. 57% of Americans who leave a church do so before the age of 18. They quit in high school. The importance, therefore, of using Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, and some of you know me from Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, because <laughs> I know you've came up to me today. <laughs> yeah, as one of my uh, college young men said to me, Father, we need short, succinct videos that I can pull up at the gym or at a bar and show somebody on my phone and say, yeah, this is what we believe. This is who we are. Look what we have. And of being available to youth during, you know, in high school, as well as in college and trade school years, how important that is. The changes brought by COVID were such that, you know, most parishes live stream liturgies now, right? Right? Do you? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> we discovered we can go to the internet and be authentically Eastern Catholic. We don't give up anything. We have to draw people out of their living rooms, though, back into the church. The importance and build, of building hunger for Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. So once again, folks, that we belong to a church that was created by the disciples of Cyril and Methodius to be a church that ministered to ordinary people using an 800-year-old tradition of theology, liturgy, and philosophy you know, from the Eastern Roman Empire, serving all of these different nationalities. And it resisted centuries of attempts, as you can see if you buy my book, which is available for only $75 and shrink up two volumes, which I'll be happy to sign for you so it becomes a second-class relic. <laughs> Somebody wanted to know, does it come with a partial indulgence? I can't do that. You got to talk to a bishop. That they resisted centuries of attempts at being assimilated into the Latin church in the Hungarian kingdom. And then again in the United States, while being authentically Eastern, while being authentically Catholic in union with the Holy See since 1646. You know, and how important this is. Bishop Ivancho wrote in 1954 when there was a threat to force our exarchate to go into the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church in America. He sent this letter to Rome. The mission of the exarchate includes not only the descendants of those who emigrated from Hungary, but also converts and other such who have become allied with our jurisdiction through the processes of proper canonical procedure, through marriage, canonical transfer of right, and conversion. That remains our mission, to be a church which serves anyone who wishes to come to faith in God through our Byzantine Catholic life. Christ promised that the church would always endure no matter what, and the Holy Spirit will teach us what to say. We face a very challenging future. We all know that in a time of war and climate change and economic and politics and so forth. But we do so knowing that while we have no idea what the future holds, we should know and trust we know who holds the future in his hands, and we are always under his guidance, and our church in particular is always under the protection of the Holy Mother of God at all times. Christ is among us. Thank you very, thank you very much for your attention.